everybody. We got a great one today, you know, for a change. And this time, this time, this time I really mean it because my guests are Joyce Vance and Barbara McQuaid, both brilliant former U.S. attorneys and current professors of law, and they are the perfect duo to kick off my year in review series. We're going to do one next week with Ann Applebaum and Frank Four on the geopolitical arena, and one the following week with Molly Jung Fast and Mark Leibovich on the year in politics. Now, Joyce and Barbara agreed to review all the court cases against Trump because I, I know for me, there are just so many that it's been kind of just hard to keep track of all of them. Uh, between all the federal cases, the state cases, the criminal cases, the civil cases. So we gave it a go, and these two are pretty damn spectacular, so you are really going to enjoy this one, you know, for a change. Now, Rudy Giuliani, of course, is indicted in Georgia and is an unindicted co-conspirator in the January 6th case, but he is such a sleazebag. A while ago, he conceded, that he had defamed Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss. Remember, they are the mother-daughter election workers who both Giuliani and Trump had accused of using a USB drive to add Biden votes. And we play the audio of Rudy defaming them when he testified to the Georgia State Senate. And it's so disgusting, I just want to, I want to play it again You'll hear it again later, but we, we didn't play Trump, but I, I want to play it here. So, uh, Peter, do you got those lined up? Yes, sir. Ready to go. OK, uh, do Trump first. We had uh, at least 18,000 that's on tape. We had them counted very painstakingly, 18,000 voters uh, having to do with uh, Ruby Friedman. That's uh, she's a vote scammer a professional vote scammer and hustler. Okay, wh what a class act. The President of the United States calling a woman who's doing a public service a vote scammer. What a, just, what a class act. But now let's listen to Rudy. <laughs> yeah, this one is disgusting. <laughs> okay, here, here we go. Tape earlier in the day of Ruby Freeman and Shay Freeman Moss and one other gentleman quite obviously, surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. I mean, it's, our it's, it's obvious to anyone who's a criminal investigator or prosecutor, they are engaged in surreptitious illegal activity again that day. Wow. And they, of course, sued him for defamation, and he conceded that he's guilty of that. Uh, but he, he doesn't seem to be forking over the money because he might not have any. Uh, well, anyway, thanks, Peter. Really, really disgusting. Yes, yes. It's important to remember how low these Trump guys are when thinking about what is at stake in, in this election. Because if he wins, the federal government will be populated with nothing but these kind of guys. Trump has promised that. You know, there's less than a year remaining till next fall's election. As we head into the new year, I want you to think of a resolution that you can make about what you can do to prevent this guy from returning to the White House, because we can't let this happen. We know who Trump is. We know who he surrounds himself with. We can't let this happen. Figure out what you are going to do in 2024 to save this nation and our futures and that of our posterity. Okay, enough of that um, for now, because we got a great one for you today, you know, for a change. I am so happy uh, to have back with me today Barbara McQuaid and Joyce Vance, both former U.S. attorneys, uh, Barbara, the Eastern District in Michigan and Joyce in the Northern District of Alabama, each from 2009 to 2017, the Obama years, of course. And uh, each of you are professors of law, Barbara at uh, the University of Michigan and Joyce at the University of Alabama. And uh, they are co-hosts of the Sisters-in-Law podcast with Jill Wine Banks and Kimberly Atkins Store. Okay. Thank you, guys. Good to be with for you. For joining me. Yeah, our pleasure. 
this is an ambitious one, okay, because I'm doing a series of year in review podcasts, and this is the first one, so I don't know how this is going to go. It's going to go fabulously. (laughs) Set the bar high, Al. Well, you know, it's kind of been a blur, all these cases. I'm going to try to review all the cases against Trump. But first, I want to remind you that last time we were together, it was latest January, and Fannie Willis had told the state judge that charges would be <laughs> imminent. You remember that? Lawyer speak. That's lawyer yeah. speak for sometime in the next year. Two or three years, right? <laughs> well, I actually don't know if you remember this, but I asked you what that meant, and Joyce ventured a guess. Two weeks. Well, so much for my crystal ball. I'm just going to hang it up. Okay. Well, that was, it turned out not till August. So that's what this. Did I get, did I hazard a guess? No. Oh, see. You wisely stayed out of that. Wisely kept my mouth shut. Yeah. (laughs) So we're going to, I'm just going to, we're going to try to review these cases. What happened sort of this year and and maybe and then project into the future a little too. So this is a lot to cover. Hey, can can I just start with a confession, um, which will maybe be comforting to your listeners, which is that now with the four criminal cases and the the host of civil cases you're going to talk about, it sometimes becomes very difficult to keep them separate. I mean, I have thought that I need one of those big whiteboards with string, you know, going from name to name because it really is complicated. So I'm glad you're doing this. Yes. Well, I, this is a service, you see, <laughs> to my listeners. I don't know if you see your podcast that way, but I see mine as a service. Okay. So the cases include the E. Jean Carroll defamation case. It's a civil case uh, where there was a trial in which the jury found for her, and there's a second one coming up. Uh, There's the fraud suit against the Trump organization brought by the New York State uh, AG, Letitia uh, James. There's the Manhattan DA's case, which is a Stormy Daniels cover-up. There's the Mar-a-Lago classified documents case brought by the special prosecutor, Jack Smith. There's the January 6th insurrection case, also brought by uh, the special prosecutor. And then there's the Georgia case brought by Fulton County DA, Fonnie Willis. And I brought, I, I did that in the order they were kind of announced, I think, or happened. So <laughs> it's funny that the Fonnie Willis one is last. Um, was I, am I missing any, any? You know, there are a couple of civil cases along the way that have dropped off the radar screen. For instance, the one in D.C. brought by Eric Swalwell and others that try to hold Trump accountable. I think it's safe to leave those out right now just because civil cases move more slowly. But they're they're still winking at us out there in the universe. Okay. Okay. Well, somebody must really have it in for Donald Trump for him to be the defendant in so many (laughs) cases. It just proves that they're out to get him, doesn't it? It's a witch hunt, damn it. Well, uh, no, I mean, I can see I can see that kind of way of thinking, you know. OK, let's go to the Georgia case first, though, since we were talking about it in January. Um, that will be tried in state court. Right. And in, I guess, August is the trial set for August. Yeah, it, it actually hasn't been set yet. There's a motion on the table to set it and then a couple of defendants who object for different reasons. Oh, OK. Uh, what are the charges here? So let, let's go to the just the charges against Trump, because it's he unlawfully conspired. Is that it to change the election outcome while participating in a criminal enterprise? That's the RICO charge. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so just to remind your listeners, Al, I'm sure they studied up on RICO in August when this was first announced. But just to remind them what RICO is. It's a charge that was originally designed to be used against organized crime with the mob in mind. The federal statute was passed in 1970 and many states followed suit, but it doesn't have to be limited to the mob. Nothing in the statute says it is. It's really to go after organized crime because what often happens is the underlings get charged and the mob bosses who don't get their hands dirty get away with it. And so this is a way to not only hold the higher ups accountable, but to hold them accountable for a variety of disparate schemes. They refer to it as a pattern of racketeering activity. And racketeering just means corrupt business practices. And so this way, they were able to pull together various schemes. For instance, one to 
pressure state legislators to convene another session, another using a false slate of electors, another intruding into computers and voting systems in Coffee right. County, uh, another um, pressuring uh, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman into falsely confessing to uh, voter fraud. So all of those individual schemes get to come under this big umbrella of RICO. And she charged the individuals who were operating on the ground, as well as the middlemen, and then the, the ultimate planner of Donald Trump at the top of the heap. Uh, and so that's how RICO works in a mob case and how Fonnie Willis is applying it in this case. Sometimes the mob boss gets caught on tape saying, all I need is uh, 11,780 votes. Maybe find those, there you huh? Go. Okay. Let's talk about the fake electors scheme. Because I think she's filed it, Georgia. Is she just talking about it, it in Georgia or all of them or some of them or just the Georgia? You know, one? sort of a hybrid. She's focused on Georgia, but because the schemes are interrelated, she does talk to some extent about what goes on other places and certainly in Washington. And it's really interesting, Al, because now there's been a little bit of reporting that suggests that in some of the other states, uh, particularly in Arizona, state's attorneys general may be taking a look at uh, cases there. So she's sort of the point person for all of the states. And her focus is really on this group of Georgia Republicans who she indicted along with Trump on charges that they were working to replace the lawfully elected electors with themselves to throw the vote of Georgia for Trump. You're saying Fonnie Willis is focused on these Arizona ones? She's or focused ones? on I'm Georgia. Sorry. Georgia. Um, but oh, okay. I, I just think it's fascinating to note that because statutes of, of limitations allow prosecutors to go, you know, several years out, this may not be the last of these cases that we see. Well, in Michigan, the attorney general of the state of Michigan, Dana Nessel, has filed criminal charges against Michigan's 16 electors, the false electors who said that they were the duly certified electors and they were casting their votes for Donald Trump. So they've been charged. So we could see charges in other states as well, I think. Just basically, how did the false electors work? So in other words, these false electors signed up to be false electors and signed their names to fake what? Yeah, so statements or so it, it it changed a little bit depending on the state because each state has its own rules. But just for example, in Michigan, allegedly these sixteen people were the people who would have signed their name as the Trump electors if he had won the state. But of course, he did not. The certified winner in Michigan was Joe Biden. But these sixteen people got together anyway and signed their name to a document that said, we're the duly elected electors of the state of Michigan and we cast our votes for Donald Trump. And then they submitted that. It went to the Senate where it was to be counted. And then, you know, we don't know how much any of these electors knew about the scheme, but in Michigan, they're charged with making a false representation for the purpose of engaging in fraud. They wanted something to happen with that as a result of their signatures. But uh, in the RICO indictment and in the Jack Smith indictment, the way the false elector scheme is charged is this was a mastermind plot between Kenneth Chesbrough and John Eastman, some lawyers mm -hmm. for Donald Trump. And the idea was you submit both slates of electors and then Mike Pence goes along for the ride and he opens them and says, oh, my goodness, I have two sets of electors from the state of Michigan. Whatever shall I do? I guess the only fair thing to do is to throw them all out and we will cast them aside and we will say they don't count. And when we throw out all of these states uh. and we count up all the electors, why look who won? It's Donald Trump. And to simply certify that, that was plan A. And then according to the Eastman okay, memo- he that's, Thank you. Thank you. Because I, I, that's clarity of something I, I wasn't clear on. Oh, good. So plan A was just to do that and declare Trump the winner. But according to the Eastman memo, he said, I predict Democrats will howl. And so plan B is for Mike Pence to say, OK, OK, I see what you're talking about. Tell you what, why don't we just send this back to the states and we'll have the congressional delegations vote and choose who ought to be the president, right. knowing that the majority of the delegations favored Republicans and would choose Trump. We'll do it that way. We'll do it the fair way. That was plan B. But both of them caused this creation of chaos by throwing into the mix from these seven states dual sets of electors. So gumming up the works, creating chaos, and trying to steal victory from that process, from that chaos. And of course, behind plan B was the insinuation that if you could create that chaos, it would force the Supreme Court 
to step in and, and intervene mm-hmm. for Trump, which has always been a little bit of a head scratcher to me. Yeah, because they didn't intervene for Trump when. No, and they had their chance. Um, The Attorney General of Texas, Ken Paxton, tried to file a lawsuit directly to the Supreme Court asking them to intervene, and they they chose not to do so. They said, thank you, not us. Well, you brought up Cheeseboro, so uh, he he has pled. So let's talk about the people who pled. It's Jenna Ellis uh, in in Georgia. Yeah. Uh, uh, Cheeseboro uh, and Sidney Powell. So what can each bring to the case against Trump? Who's the most dangerous? To Trump. Yeah, so this is such a good question. I, I have an obvious candidate and then perhaps a dark horse. I think Jenna Ellis is the cooperating co-defendant who has most clearly an agreement with Fonnie Willis that calls for her to cooperate. And of course, she was very, very close to Rudy Giuliani. There is reporting this morning, by the way, from Hugo Lowell in The Guardian that says that Fonnie Willis will not offer plea deals to Trump, to Giuliani, or to Mark Meadows. So Mm -hmm. having Jenna Ellis, who can testify against Giuliani and implicate him and Trump, may prove to be very important to Willis's case. Um, But here's my dark horse. Scott Hall is a Georgia bail bondsman. He pleaded guilty in connection with this scheme to compromise Coffee County voting machines. Hall has, I believe it's a brother-in-law who was well-placed in the Trump campaign. He did day of election work at a very high level. And I wonder if there's not going to be some sort of an implication there of informal backdoor communication between the Trump campaign and Hall as this whole scheme evolved. I'm very curious about that piece. Um, you mentioned Rudy and, and Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, uh, mother-daughter election workers. And uh, in a civil case, Rudy said, okay, I, I, uh, he, he conceded that he had defamed both of them. And this was about uh, their uh, adding votes for Biden supposedly with a USB port. Can, can, hey, Peter, do you have that audio? I want to play that if, we, if you have it. Do you remember this? I it do. Was, Is it where he said they were passing yeah. around a vial or a, a USB port like it was a vial of cocaine? Yes. And that's the thing that turned out to be the ginger yeah. mint. Tape earlier in the day of Ruby Freeman and Shea Freeman Moss and one other gentleman quite obviously surreptitiously passing around USB ports as if they are vials of heroin or cocaine. <laughs> I mean, it's, our sta- okay. it's, it's obvious to anyone who's a criminal investigator or prosecutor, they are engaged in surreptitious illegal activity again that day. Okay, so you guys are prosecutors. Was it obvious to you? That I don't even what know what a USB port is, right? I mean, is he trying to say thumb drives? But um, <laughs> no, beyond that, this is obviously ludicrous. And just, you know, this is scurrilous. I mean, Giuliani understands that when you compare what someone's doing to trafficking and cocaine, that you're dirtying them up unfairly. He did this at a minimum knowingly, but probably deliberately. And it, it's just really horrible. I mean, it's why all three of us remember it so clearly. It's just horrible. And I'll add, as a former prosecutor, I think it's disgusting. It is not evidence of uh, scurrilous activity or whatever he says it is. He throws in a little racism, you know, to uh, uh, grease the yeah, grease the handle. The what, what's the metaphor? Grease the skin, <laughs> gild the lily, uh, top the Sunday, whatever it they is. They had death threats against them, and they, uh, I mean, this was something that ruined their lives for a long period of time, and I hope they're well. And, and so is he, is he just out of money? I mean, why is he conceded this, but is he going to pay them? I think that's the question, right? He's clearly going to have judgment entered against him. I hope it will be for a substantial sum of money. Giuliani, you know, his financial condition is bad. There may be other creditors in line. These women really deserve to be compensated for the way he upended their lives. And, you know, I'm sure we all know people who volunteer to work in elections it's not a sexy job. You're not doing it because a lot of positive attention gets paid to you. It's because you care about the process and you're a good public servant and you want to be part of something that's bigger than yourself. So here these women are just minding their own business and suddenly their lives are upended, just completely disrupted. They can't go home. They can't you know, say their name in a grocery store. If ever there were deserving plaintiffs for compensation, it's these two women. 
And the Fonnie Willis indictment goes really even above and beyond the ugly statements that Rudy Giuliani made about them. I mean, they sent in operatives to try to extort them into falsely confessing that, oh, yes, I did commit election fraud. Uh, And that part of the scheme, I think, is so outrageous and so awful. Um, imagine, you know, pay, paying them off and, you know, I can help you, you know, there could be criminal consequences right. if you don't admit what you did. Uh, I mean, it's really just awful the way these two women were abused. Disgusting is a good word. Scurrilous is also a good word, but disgusting. Uh, but anyway, so Giuliani has been disbarred and, um, Trump threw a hundred thousand dollar plate dinner for him at Bedminster in September. So I hope some of that gets to them. Oh, well, one last thing. This is in state court. So if Trump gets convicted here and does get elected, he can't pardon himself. Right? Yeah, that's right. In Georgia, um, and it isn't even the governor of Georgia, currently a Republican, but no friend of Donald Trump. They have a bipartisan commission that reviews pardons. And you don't get pardoned until like five years after you've served your time either. There. Yeah. So right? a, a pardon like of that. Donald Trump seems very unlikely and certainly not any time in the near future if he is convicted. But, you know, I think it's just worth saying this because I Barb's absolutely right. That doesn't mean Trump won't try it, right? If there's anything we've learned about him, he has no respect for the rule of law. You can be sure that he would try to meddle in the Georgia prosecution because he would be fighting for his life. And so I think it's worth listening to all these cautions that we're seeing about his plans to, on one hand, engage the military more in civilian life and to take over the Justice (laughs) Department. I I think we need to pay attention to all of that instead of write it off as things that can't happen. Very, very well put. Let's jump to uh, the recent fraud case uh, against the Trumps. And I'm not talking about these can get confusing. It's not the Alan Weisselberg uh, case uh, where he pled guilty and went to Rikers. This one is about uh, the Trump organization or and, and the Trumps giving overvaluations of their property to get better terms on loans, right? That's almost over. But this brings up to me gag orders because uh, there were a number of them <laughs> in this one where he, uh, Trump... Uh, uh, identified one of the clerks as Chuck Schumer's girlfriend. I mean, which is ridiculous. Talk about the gag orders. Yeah. I, can I can I take the first stab at this one? And Joyce, feel free to supplement what I forget to mention. But this issue is so important to me because I hear so many people misframing it. Even the ACLU, which does you know great work, but they filed an amicus brief in here. And what they're conflating is two things. One is the general rules that apply to everybody in the world, right? There are criminal statutes, there are civil laws. And in that world, the government can't pass what are called prior restraints and prevent us from speaking. We have very broad First Amendment free speech rights, especially when it comes to what's called core political speech. And even there, it's not absolute, but to restrict speech, you have to show that there's a compelling governmental interest and that the limitation is narrowly tailored to achieve that interest. Okay, that's one world. But what we're operating in is a different world. We're operating in the world of a pending case. In New York, it's a pending civil case. In Washington, D.C., it's a pending criminal case. And there, a judge has not only a right, but a duty to ensure the fair administration of justice and the safety of the witnesses and the parties and the court personnel. And so in that world, the court may abridge a person's First Amendment rights, just as they may abridge a person's uh, Fourth Amendment rights about uh, privacy and uh, Second Amendment rights about possessing a gun while on bond. All of those rights are are in this different framework. And so there, there's nothing wrong with a judge imposing a gag order on Donald Trump. And so when his lawyers get out there and say, this is unprecedented restriction on a presidential candidate's core political speech, They are, I believe, deliberately misleading the courts and the public as to what this issue is all about. Yes. So Barb is absolutely right. And I would only add one thing to that analysis, which is that in the criminal case, I know we're not quite there yet, but in the criminal case, Trump is free on bond pending trial. 
And in order to remain free on bond, he has to live up to the conditions of that bond. And one is that he not commit new or additional crimes. He's also been warned against compromising witnesses, taking any steps that might threaten the process. That happened at arraignment, which is sort of unusual, where the magistrate judge who arraigned Trump admonished him against doing anything like what he has proceeded to do. So I think the gag orders are fair both in the criminal context, but also in the civil case where the law says the judge is entitled to ensure the fair administration of justice. And that's what he's doing by trying to prevent attacks on his law clerk. You know, it took, I I forget now, I think it was 275 single spaced pages to detail all of the attacks that the law clerk received, phone, email, voicemail, about half Mm -hmm. of them very anti-Semitic, very graphic threats against her simply for doing her job because Donald Trump chose to target her. Well, and think about it. As soon as the gag order was lifted in the fraud trial at one point, as soon as it happened, Trump put out a thing that that someone that people should uh, make a citizen's arrest on Judge Erdogan. Oof. And that's very dangerous, of course, to try. anyway. Let, well, let's move to the criminal trial then, because the same thing, same issue is in uh, Judge Shutkin's case there. This is the January 6th trial. Let's review th- that case. One defendant, it's Trump. Uh, what are the charges here? Yes. So there are three conspiracy charges and one substantive charge, and all of them center around election interference. The first is a conspiracy to defraud the United States. The second is a conspiracy to interfere with an official proceeding, the certification. And there's also a substantive count of doing that. And then the final count is a civil rights conspiracy to interfere with the right to vote. As you point out, there's only one defendant, Trump, But we have conspiracy charges, which have to involve two or more people. And the way that works is that there are some unnamed, unindicted, but of course, readily identifiable co-conspirators, not charged in this case. I got them. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, John Eastman, Sidney Powell, Jeffrey Clark, uh, Kenneth Cheeseborough, and a political consultant. This is the one we don't know political consultant who helped implement a plan to submit fraudulent slates of presidential electors to obstruct the certification proceeding. Now, a couple of these, uh, Sidney Powell and uh, Kenneth Cheeseborough, have pled in Georgia. So does that automatically mean they their testimony to Willis can be used? Not not necessarily, but it, it, as a lawyer representing a defendant in a criminal case, it would be very odd to cooperate in one forum and not cooperate in the other forum. And so they've provided, you know, recorded statements to Fannie Willis. Those could conceivably be used against them in the criminal case in Washington, D.C. if they were to be charged down the road. And so I would imagine that at some point, if not already, their lawyers are talking to Jack Smith about a deal for them regarding anticipated prosecution in Washington, D.C. This is sort of uh, yes, I, I won't charge you if kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or or you charge, but in ex- you'll, you'll get leniency in a sentence. You'll get a reduction. You know, the same thing we saw in um, Georgia where they entered guilty pleas and got sentences of probation. Although I find that extremely generous. I don't know that they would get the same treatment by a federal prosecutor. Okay. Uh, well, I think this is the big enchilada, frankly, that this one, partly because it's first, but it's also something that everybody saw very plainly. It feels the most important, right? I mean, Trump attacked our democracy. That's what this indictment seeks to hold him accountable for. And what happens to our democracy if he he gets away with it, right? If you can just do that, like that's not a crime or he's acquitted. uh, What does that mean for future elections and future presidents? So it's a really important case. I I think the stakes are really high for our nation. And something, if, if you'll just indulge me for one second, I'll, I'll play it being the appellate lawyer in the room and say something that should be on everybody's radar screen is that Trump has filed motions to dismiss this indictment for a number of different reasons. Some of them have constitutional dimensions, and he will be able to appeal 
if the judge rules against him before the case goes to trial. So this case is set for early March. Um, I, I think that we can expect that we will see those appeals, that Judge Chutkin will rule against Trump. And then the question will be, how quickly are the appellate courts, the D.C. Circuit and the Supreme Court, willing to take those appeals on? And, and will they do it in time for this case to go to trial as scheduled? Really? Did not know that. Oof. Yeah, it's not a pleasant thought. But, you know, the hope is that the appellate courts are up to it. If they aren't, there could be this cascading series of delays that affects all of the cases behind that one. Yeah. You know, just to share what might be bad news for people, I don't think any of these trial dates are etched in stone. Mm-hmm. I know that we see them and we think, oh, good, this will be, you know, it's going to start March and we'll have a, a verdict, you know, by April or May. It's it's rare that a first trial date sticks because all these motions get filed and sometimes they have to go up on appeal and stuff happens. And so I know that uh, the prosecution wants to work hard to maintain these dates. I imagine the court does too, just because of the specter of the election out there. But it wouldn't surprise me to see some of these trial dates move. Well, as you said, the uh, Supreme Court kind of ruled against him in that Texas Attorney General yep. case. So um, maybe this could be disposed of fairly fast. Yep. We know they can move fast when they want to. That's good. Uh, Will we hear a lot of new evidence in this in the January 6th? I I think we will, don't you? I don't know. Um, You know, the January 6th uh, House Select Committee uncovered so much evidence. I think the one thing that has never really been connected up for me, and I don't know whether this will come out at the trial just because it's not really alleged, is whether there was ever any connection between the people at the Willard Hotel war room and the insurrectionists. Uh, you know, there's some loose connections, like Roger Stone is hanging out with the Proud Boys and they're providing security for Michael Flynn on January 6th. But was there ever any connection? You know, we've got that weird conversation with um, Rudy Giuliani talking about, isn't it going to be great, Cassidy Hutchinson, on January 6th when Trump returns to the Capitol and Mark Meadows was talking about going over to the uh, Willard Hotel on January 5th. I've never, we've never really tied all that up. And I'm curious as to whether they can prove any connection there. Speaking of which, uh, some of that we heard from Cassidy Hutchinson. Mm-hmm. And some of her testimony was about things she actually heard and saw herself. But some was secondhand like that. Yeah, yeah. I think a lot of her testimony may be hearsay. And she may have been helpful for prosecutors in finding witnesses who can provide direct testimony about what defendants in the case did. But Barb's point is one. I mean, she and I share that bugaboo wondering about the Willard war rooms, which got a lot of publicity and not very much closure. And I think, Al, if we hear new evidence in this trial facts that we haven't heard before. It may be in the testimony of witnesses, possible unindicted co-conspirators who will testify and who may tell their stories more completely than they have in the past, or may tell them for the first time in some cases, and may fill in some of the detail and, and narrate the story of the coup. I wonder why Meadows was indicted in Georgia, but not in D.C., or, yeah, or th- that was really surprising to me because his omission from the federal indictment led me to conclude that he's cooperating, like full on board, you know, hook, line and sinker. And then he gets charged in Georgia, which seems really strange. Again, you know, just on the theory that we, we said earlier, if you're going to cooperate, you kind of got to be all in or all out. And the fact that, you know, he didn't get charged or even named as an unindicted co-conspirator there in D.C., is really interesting to me and then gets charged in Georgia. So I, I don't know the answer to that question. It's, it's a mystery. You know, Cassidy Hutchinson, this is just such a chilling piece of evidence. She's the one who said that Mark Meadows burned stuff in his fireplace in the White House after meetings oh, yeah. with folks. That's, That's right. not, I mean, I mean, Barb, did you ever burn stuff in your fireplace when you were a U.S. attorney? <laughs> no. I didn't have a fireplace, but, you know, if I had, I would I mean, not it's That's just crazy <laughs> stuff. And, and it seems like Meadows, who has a very good lawyer, a former high-ranking DOJ official, is trying to walk this tightrope that keeps him from going to prison. I think he's going to fall off. Really? Okay. Let, let's uh, talk about E. Jean Carroll. In May, after a two-week trial, the jury decided that he was guilty of sexually abusing her and defaming her and awarded her $5 million. And then he subsequently defamed her again. 
Is that, is that right? What did he say to defame her again? Yeah, the same thing that he had said previously, right? And, and full disclosure, E. Jean is a good friend and a knitting buddy. Um, but he said, not my type, you know, not attractive, and she's a liar. Wasn't this when he repeated it on CNN? He did, like the next, that town hall. The next day. So yeah, after the verdict comes in, you know, like the next, the day after, he goes back and repeats it again uh, on national television. And so she says, all right, re-up, let's do it again. <laughs> so they're back in court in January. Yep. And as she, uh, how does this work? She had a $5 million judgment, right? right or something. When does she get that? Is he appealing that, of course? Yeah, he is appealing that. And so it won't be until the appeals are resolved that uh, that payment will come due. But if he f- fails to pay it, she can, you know, garnish wages, garnish uh, payments and other kinds of things and go after his assets. So I imagine she'll get her money. It's at some actually point. pretty interesting. You know, normally if you lose and you appeal your civil case, you have to get get an appeal bond, which is essentially a promise to pay the whole amount or the person who issues the bond will pay it for you if you default. Trump, for whatever reason, didn't get an appeal bond. He actually paid the full amount directly into the court's account. So it's sitting there for E. Jean to collect on if he loses the appeal. I don't know if he couldn't get a bond or what the deal was, but that's fairly <laughs> unusual. <laughs> It sounds like he maybe couldn't get a bond. I don't well, know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We're, that's conjecture. Okay. Uh, the documents case. Now, that seems like the easiest to prove. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah, I, I think so, too. And, you know, some of the things that Donald Trump has said and done to try to muddy the waters is this idea that they're his under the Presidential Records Act or and that he had the ability and did declassify them. And both of those defenses just fail as a matter of law. The Presidential Records Act was passed in the wake of Watergate to specify that these documents do not belong to the president, but belong to the people of the United States and go back to the National Archives. So having them uh, is a crime. It's a violation of the Espionage Act, which makes it a crime to willfully retain uh, national defense information in the form of documents or other forms. And so that's one defense that fails. The other, that he declassified the documents, is irrelevant because of the charge the government selected, which is the Espionage Act and not some Retention of Classified Documents Act. So it doesn't matter whether they are or are not classified. In fact, many of them are, but that's sort of um, not a relevant issue here. What is relevant is that they pertain to the national defense. That's what makes it a violation of the Espionage Act, which uh. was passed during World War I in a time when we didn't have the classification system. So both of those defenses will fail. And I think it's a really strong case. He's caught with the goods. It's you know a, a contraband. He's caught red-handed with them in his house. And the other part of it that really makes this a prosecutable case, very different from what we've seen with Mike Pence, probably with Joe Biden, is it's not an unintentional retention in the allegations about the obstruction of the investigation uh, are very good evidence there of his consciousness of guilt because he's moving the boxes around. And when the lawyers come and the Justice Department come, he mo- has the mo- the guys move him out of one place and into another. And he's got it all on videotape and tries and to destroy that. they try to that. destroy the server. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but when will that case be? Because we have uh, Aileen Cannon, who is the judge who, you know, I don't want to say she's suspect because she was appointed by by Trump, but she's uh, I think she's a little suspect because early in the case, she made some judgments that were overturned by the circuit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I read her, too. You know, she hasn't done anything that's egregiously illegal in, in this case. Um, the stuff that she did with the search last year was really off base. And I think that is what has caused people to be very suspect of her and her motives. But she's definitely hinted in this case that she's going to delay the trial date. She hasn't yet. But, you know, some of the delays she's already kind of built in. For example, the government wants Donald Trump to identify the classified documents he intends to use at trial so that they can work through how they're going to protect them, which will take some time. She has said, government, don't bother me with that until March. 
if they're going to do that in March, that really suggests that they're kind of coming up against it in May and that she that's, is that's not when working. That's scheduled right so, now. Yeah, she's not working hard to stay true to that date. So I think that's what has people a little jittery about that trial. Date. Look, I'm just going to come out and say it. I am more than jittery about this case. When she first got, not not the criminal case, but the earlier case, the effort to do an end run around the search of Mar-a-Lago and keep the government from being able to use that evidence, I was, you know, that early voice that said, well, it doesn't really matter that she's a Trump appointee. All judges are appointed by, you know, a president from one party or the other. And and then she went on to fulfill all of the biggest concerns. And and I was actually wrong to encourage people to give her, you know, a minute before they judged um, because she has proven herself to be very biased. Of course, there's that first matter where the 11th Circuit just resoundingly bench slapped her. They said, you lacked jurisdiction to hear this case. It was a very bizarre situation where Trump filed a civil case instead of just proceeding against the search warrant as the criminal case evolved. And the 11th Circuit said, you know, are you out of your mind? And she was a former appellate litigator in the U.S. Attorney's Office in Miami. She knew better. Now we have her in this case. She's been had a lot of animosity towards the government. She's been slow to rule. She's playing into Trump's delay game. This failure to rule on classified issues or to even consider the the final scheduling until next year is just nuts. And and in my circuit, the 11th Circuit. Nuts, that's a legal term. That is a legal term of art. She is nuts. (laughs) Um, In the 11th Circuit, my circuit, it is not unheard of for the Court of Appeals to look at a judge's conduct and say, you know, there's some history here. And the judge may not have bias, but this judge has made some rulings and has been reversed, and it would be impossible for the judge to set that aside. So in the interests of justice, so the public can have confidence that the case is being conducted by a neutral judge, we're going to recuse and ask the chief judge in the court to reassign this case to a new judge. If this case had been positioned early on for the 11th Circuit to make that sort of a a ruling and remove Judge Cannon, they would have. It is a little bit late right now. It would certainly delay the case to have a new judge. But here's the problem. Once this case does go to trial, if it actually gets there, the trial judge gets to make a lot of discretionary calls about what evidence gets admitted and what evidence doesn't get admitted. And it's too late to appeal if she excludes the government's evidence and Trump gets acquitted. If he's acquitted, the government doesn't get to appeal. They can't try him again if she makes mistakes because of double jeopardy. So that's ball game. And everything in this very important case that involves really serious national security concerns comes down to Eileen Cannon. And I don't have confidence in her. Okay, well, let's end on that note. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> sorry for the diatribe I, no that is uh that's chilling uh, uh but uh we I, I think we've gone through the cases i wanted to go through i i mean i do think the january 6th case is the case yep i'll, I'll give you some wrap up that maybe will give you uh our listeners a little bit of hope i think the january 6th case is is going to go forward i think it's if it doesn't go forward right on its trial date of march 4th it will go forward before the election i think the charge of conspiracy to defraud the united states is a very strong one and i think justice will prevail yeah i agree with with barb about that and i'll say one more thing i have enormous confidence in voters in this country In 2020, we saw people go to the polls in record numbers. I think Americans can look at the evidence, sort out the issues, and that ultimately they're going to do the right thing for the country in 2024, and Trump will not be reelected, even if he's the nominee. Okay. Well, uh, we have about a year to go. Uh, (laughs) I I, I hope you're right. I I have confidence, but... um, this is such a so much at stake here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I thank you guys. This is I I, I I do think this has been very helpful for people to wrap their heads around all all that's uh, behind us and all that's going to be ahead of us. So uh, thank you so much. This has been great. Yeah, and thanks to your listeners for uh, for wanting to be engaged and learn about the issues. It's so important to have an informed electorate. I hope you'll invite us back after Trump is convicted. You got it. You got it. You got it. Well, I I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. 
That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.